This conference will now be recorded. We're going to talk about planting into heavy cover crops. And that picture you see there in the background, I got a little maybe better picture later on, but uh, that is the definition in my mind of a heavy cover crop. I'm not sure what the biomass is, but this was uh, taken last year. We were planting for a neighbor and they uh, he, he didn't think his planter would be able to go through that. And that was actually, I think, June the 14th. That was triticale. And you can, the, 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 the seed heads were just about filling out. It was past the milky dough stage. That is for sure. And, and there was a little bit that was mature enough that did grow later on, but it didn't matter too much. Uh, but that was just because that was a wet area that wasn't being able to plant be planted. Uh, knowing what I know, I wouldn't doubt we we'll, won't be back to that field for a couple of weeks uh, if it's going to be planted into corn again. I guess I'm not sure if it is, but uh, just to say that so far with the wet season that seems to be upon a lot of us here, uh, this would be a topic that I wanted to that I wanted to talk about today and uh, how to effectively be able to deal with uh, heavy uh, you know, very heavy cover crop residues. So um, it's uh, it's something that is, I would say, uh, doable, but you got to have some knowledge in how to do this right. And a lot of it has to do with the equipment and how to get the proper equipment and how to set it and everything. So I want to uh, show you a few uh, pictures here of some of the setups that are out there. Um, a lot of these, I'm going to I'm gonna be a little biased here. Uh, a lot of them are from uh, Pennsylvania, and I'm going to tell you maybe the reason why a little bit later. Uh, that's where I'm from. Of course, I got a rag in my home state, but um, this has just gone into a pretty much straight stand of hairy vetch, and I would have to say this represents one of the easiest uh, ways to uh, be able to uh, to plant into into cover crops uh, in, in a situation where uh, hairy vetch is a, a, a viney type, very succulent type cover crop, and it's not that hard to be able to plant into. So I'll just start by saying if you have something like uh, hairy vetch or even a crimson clover, it's not that difficult. You don't really need a lot of uh, rollers or anything on your planter uh, in that regard. So that's just just one of those things that uh, I just thought I'd show how that all works in that regard. And then there's other situations. And believe it or not, um, this this picture I believe I got it from a fellow in Missouri, but that's not that difficult to plan into either, uh, because it's nice standing cereal rye mostly. It's about all I see in there, and you know it's tall and it freaks some people out. But uh, that's actually not that hard to plan into. Now, this is where you want to probably roll down your uh, cover crop. And there's several different options in rolling. We're going to talk a lot about the rollers that are on the planters. Uh, we're going to share, share some pictures on that. And we're also going to talk about other types of rollers and so forth to get the crop down. Especially if you're planting corn, you want to make sure <clears throat> there's not a lot of standing cover. <clears throat> cover crop because it will uh, it will shade the corn out and corn gets a little leggy and it stretches and it's it just is not good soybeans on the other hand don't seem to mind a little shade uh, that's been the experience I have seen guys plant soybeans into cover crop looking like a six foot tall cereal rye and basically just whatever the planter and a tractor ran down was it and when they came back to harvest it you could still see some of those uh, cereal rye plant standing in there. I do not recommend that. Uh, but in talking to a few people, they say, you know, it wasn't that bad. Uh, so I don't know if they compared anything, but, you know, you're running a little bit more through the combine, but that is so dry at that point, doesn't make a whole lot of a difference. Uh, but that being said, this is just some of the different uh, options that are out there for uh, for doing this. Uh, then the, the other... Um, some other examples here is more of a thicker, uh, less mature, but very thick type of a cover crop. I'm going to show some some more pictures of this, too. This is from one of our cover crop uh, innovator members, Jim Hershey, here in Pennsylvania. 
and uh, he's been doing this for about three years now with the rolling of the cover crops on the planter. So uh, there is, uh, this is another option uh, that you can do. And I would say this is not for rookies uh, or else you wanna have a lot of, uh, you know, education and go to field days and so forth before you start something like this. Cause there is quite a bit to, to do and to be able to understand. So if you look underneath this planter, this is what you see. Uh, these are the uh, Dawn Equipment uh, ZRX roller crimpers. They were made by a Pennsylvania farmer, Charlie Martin, uh, but uh, Dawn sells these now to be put on a wide array of planters that are out there. And uh, so this is kind of getting a lot of the attention these days. It is, it is uh, not cheap, I'll just say that, but in the context of what you get out of it, uh, you, you just certainly do have some uh, opportunities, I'll say, to be able to let the cover crops grow huge and big. And one of the keys here is those row cleaners that are actually discs in this case, that they really part the cover crop so you get good seed to soil contact. And this is in a, in a way what makes it a little easier, makes the rest of the planter work and function uh, very easily because you're essentially going into, I'm going to call it a an ultra mini strip till uh I shouldn't really call it strip till because we're not going into the soil, but it actually, maybe I should say it's just a very aggressive row cleaner. These these can be set to different um, depths or different amounts of aggression. I know some farmers lift them up and don't even use them, but then you got to make sure you have good, uh, you know, good be, be able to have uh, good seed to soil contact. Plant your seeds a little deeper. We're going to talk about that later. And then your, that your closing wheels don't wrap because if you have any sort of a spoked type closing wheel, uh, that could be an issue for wrapping. And we're going to talk about that later on. Um, I did want to pay a little tribute to, uh, I, I think what I would have to say is is one of the, the, the leading pioneers behind this. And his name is Charlie Martin, as I've mentioned there. He's from Pennsylvania. He's the guy there in the center. He's a very, very innovative type person. and uh, but he's been doing this, if I looked at my records correctly here, since about 2011, 2012, somewhere in, in that range. Because uh, I remember at some of my field days uh, that I used to have, you know, he would bring his planter two hours and bring him to uh, the, bring him to the field days to demonstrate them. And here's just a picture of his planter. So this is the first planter that these type of rollers were built onto. So a little bit of historical fact there. Uh, and then I'm gonna just show you in a second here, a picture of his farm. So uh, in case you're interested, this is where the whole concept of rolling with a planter was birthed uh, in central Pennsylvania. And so uh, there's quite a few planters now in the area that has his units on, or now he has sold the licensing rates or licensed to Dawn Equipment, Dawn Biologic, um, and that's where that's at. So um, it's just uh, his his whole rationale was well, let's let the cover crops grow, let's let them you know cover the soil so it saves an erosion. You can see his farm is hilly. It's a typical Pennsylvania farm right there, and uh, so and I understand fully too. For me. In my situation, I have a, I already had a roller years and years ago. I got my roller in 1995. And so I, uh, I roll as well, but that's mainly for my pumpkins and that I grow uh, about 80 acres of pumpkins and squash. So um, uh, again, just to kind of wrap up a little bit of the history here, uh, I, I dug his picture out when I was preparing this because I think it's, it's kind of makes a little statement in this whole thing about uh, roll, uh, managing co heavy cover crops and planting. Uh, this is a, a hybrid planter here of three different uh, makes, if you will. Obviously, John Deere planting units, but it has, uh, this was back in 2013. This is a field day at my farm, and this was a demonstration of that, so it was done in the fall, and that's why the, that's why the crops look like they do there. Uh, but uh, this was Charlie Martin's rollers, and then Peckway planter, you kind of see that hidden there on the on the frame there is a local Amish uh, outfit that has built a lot of no-till planters. So you have Peckway planter with the rollers and with the John Deere planting units on, 
to, this planter is designed to plant into heavy covers. There's certainly enough of demand around here for this kind of a technique uh, to be used. So um, I might just stop there a second. Uh, John Johnson, I want to uh, uh, unmute you here. John, uh, you have a planter with rollers on, correct? And can you tell us a little bit about your experience with it and what you like about it? Yes, I have two planters with uh, Charlie Martin's uh, roller crimpers on, a six row and a 12 mm -hmm. row. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm very, very satisfied with that setup. Now, obviously you don't roll down short cover crop, but uh, you, get, you get a cereal that is mature and it does a great job. So how do you adjust the, uh, we'll call them the row cleaners up front. How, do, you, do you manage them? Do you get more aggressive sometimes, less aggressive? Or how do you run your row cleaners? I do not change the relationship between the discs and the rollers very often. Uh -huh. But I do, uh -huh. sometimes I put some fresh down pressure on. Sometimes I let them float. In fact, lots of times I just let those okay. units float. And that seems to just okay. clean out the residue without disturbing any soil, which is exactly what I want. Yep. That's the spoken from a true no-teller right there, John. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, wondering about what kind of closing wheels do you have on your planter? Uh, these two planters are Case IH. So, okay. uh, you know, they have the... Discs, actually, we don't have the inverted discs on anymore. We have the crumbling wheels instead of them. And then behind that, of course, is a press wheel with the gotcha. chevron pattern. Right. And so that has done very well for us. Good. I'm also going to um, I'm going to open up the mics for everybody. Is there anybody else who either uh, has a planner with these type of rollers or has worked with them or seen them that wants to comment on any uh, anything that they have or maybe questions for John here. Uh, just want to pause a little bit. So um, who has a comment or a question about these kind of rollers? Because we're, we're going to start to move on to some other aspects, but I wanted to cover this while we're here. Yeah, this is Lloyd. I have a Great Plains twin row planter, and so I don't have the row cleaner. I have a, a, a second roller. Uh, where the row cleaner is, and it does uh, does pretty well. Now I do have colders to to cut through the debris, and uh, uh, when you plant through, for the most part, you don't see any bare ground at all. Okay. Okay. So are, are your are your rollers similar to these, Lloyd? Similar yes, to this it's style. Don, it's a Don Logic. Uh, okay. System, okay. and instead of having yep. the row cleaner with a twin row. Uh, we, you know, they couldn't put row cleaners for twin rows, right. so they put a an additional roller uh, to split the difference uh, of the twin rows. Okay. Okay, good. Any other questions uh, on this topic, Stephanie? Um, Steve, I was interested in uh, the question of down pressure. Um, if you're mounting a roller unit on the planter, um, does it? matter where that rolling unit is attached on the on the planter unit or on the on the bar itself and if you have another unit on the planter does that affect the down pressure you're able to put on in in the actual planting of the crop john do you want to answer that question uh these roller crimpers are attached to the seven by seven main frame of the planter so, uh, hey, the only thing I have noticed, if I put full down pressure on, once in a while, I'll see a wing being up a little more than I would like. I've never seen a problem with uh, germination on the seed. We've always gotten it in deep enough, but I do, I am careful of that. Mm -hmm. so, so it is a little bit of a balancing act, depending on what type of a planter you have, how heavy it is. Maybe you could say how much, if you have fertilizer tanks on, how full they are, right, John? I mean, it, there is some variables. Exactly. It is, yes. I think, Stephanie, to answer your question, it is something you need to be aware of. And, I mean, I, I know in extremely dry conditions or harder conditions, 
sometimes I've had to refill my uh, fertilizer tanks up before they get empty because you start you start losing enough of uh, a weight that's needed to get the job done. So, anyone else have any comments on the the rollers that are attached to planters? Hey, Steve, this is David. Yes, David. Um, at SIUC at Carbondale this past year, they had some Don ZRXs mounted onto a Kinsey, I think it was a four row planter. And mm -hmm. at their field day, they were demonstrating and it was, it was working really good. But uh, to go back to Stephanie's point, they were putting full down pressure on that ZRX and it was lifting that planter up, basically mm -hmm. almost pushing it out of the ground. And they were commenting of, of they were having a hard time getting the, the seed depth. And if they would just take a look at what they were doing, they could have just not put so much down pressure on right. that. It didn't. It didn't require a whole lot for what they were trying to accomplish. Right. But they were just completely. Right. They were acting like they were trying to plow with it. So that's one thing to <laughs> well, watch. Well, yeah, I hear you. Um, I, 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 I just comment on that again. It's, it's all about getting the planter balanced, and sometimes, in some conditions, it would warrant adding extra weight, but. I would argue that unless it's an organic situation and you're really trying to crimp and kill that cover crop with that roller, you don't need a tremendous amount of down pressure on it. Uh, most most of the people are, are going to be using some herbicides, or I like to say a little herbicide. It goes a long way with these rollers. Um, but in an organic situation, you do have to have a certain amount of pressure on that and uh, what I have found, and this is just pretty basic, pretty general rule of thumb, of about 200 to 250 pounds per foot, per linear foot, for most of these rollers is, a, is about the sweet spot to get a good crimp on, on this. So you might have to do the math there a little bit, but no doubt about it, there's, there, there's, these cylinders and uh, hydraulic adjustments on these are, are strong enough that they can literally take weight off the rest of the planter and... You know, you're not doing any good if you're doing a great job of rolling and not getting the seeds in the ground. So <clears throat> I think that's what's important for people to understand and know in this uh, context. So uh, so any more questions from anybody on the rollers on planters before we before we move on? I have one uh, while you're thinking. Uh, Brett Jones asked here on the chat, is there any species that rolling does not work on? And and I guess I have to kind of answer that question. It depends if you're organic or not. And I bring it up because this has been used in an organic situation. So I will say if you're not organic, um, I can't think of any species that it won't do the job of simply flattening out the residue. Uh, if you are organic, one of the ones you would do definitely want to stay away from would be annual ryegrass. Uh, annual ryegrass does not get terminated with rolling. Uh, I'm just going to be blunt about that. It just doesn't. Um, it's it it doesn't have the way it's designed. It it won't it won't it won't crimp it off to to kill it like cereal rye, triticale, hairy vets, crimson clover, and a lot of other ones will do. So that would be my quick answer to that, uh, Brent. Um, and then um, Michael asked, uh, are there any benefits or problems to post planting? rolling and that's been done before and i'm glad you brought that up because i didn't have that in my presentation but um i would i would just say that uh yes it's been done uh the only thing is you know when you're when you're rolling again you don't want to drive on your rows if you can help it depends what the soil conditions is of course but um uh, you know the the concern sometimes with a heavy cover is will some of that fold over a little bit and, and be on top of the row. Usually that's not an issue. Um, so uh, I, I think my, my general answer to your question about post planting rolling is that yes, it's okay. Just be careful how you do it. Uh, for I will, I will say this, if you don't have a roller and or don't have the money to invest, because this is a, this is a steep investment um, on this. And uh, if you don't have that, it's easier to plant first and then roll second because a lot of the times when you roll in a separate pass from your planter if it's a, if your roller is separate you need to pretty much roll the field the way you're going to plant it 
because you cannot roll things and then plant across the stems of like cereal rye. It's very difficult to cut through them, especially if they're mature. So that's some of the, re the reasons for planting first. And another thing is your planter can go through a standing crop. There's less residue at the soil surface for it to deal with, and it's easier to get the seed into the ground. So post rolling is fine. Um, I don't think I would recommend that you just do this and do the whole farm that way the first year you do it, uh, because you do want to make sure you do a good job of, 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 of doing that uh, post planting. And there again, you know, when do you put herbicides on? All those questions need to be answered. I would suggest you, you would put a herbicide on first and then roll and get it down, especially for corn and, uh, and so forth. So uh, any more questions while we're paused now? I'm going to have to move on here soon, but I do want to answer any questions. Uh, let's, let's, let's keep the questions to planter mounted rollers before we move on. Any more questions? By the way, John, can you tell us um, approximately what, what is the cost per row of, of these rollers? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, the last one I got on, uh, I don't know, there was some around. Somewhere around uh, twelve hundred dollars a row. That's that's the number I've heard. Twelve hundred bucks a row. So obviously a big investment. Yes. Um, and and I, I will say, if if you you want you got to be a serious cover cropper to consider this um, because I have heard people uh, being disappointed where they spent twelve hundred dollars a row, row and they didn't feel it was worth it. And then you ask the question, well, how big was the was the rye or how big was the cover crop? And they'll say, well, it was about 18 inches. Well, 18 inches really isn't that big. And I would say if you're trying to, if you're one of those guys that you want everything planted early, uh, these rollers may not be uh, justified. Uh, but some larger operators or I know uh, several farmers, they have wet areas. They're historically wet and they just know they won't get to be planting in there early. And so they just leave, use the cover crop to dry out the fields. And they're going to, they know they're going to be not planting until the end of May. And so there's the, there's where you have a very good reason to use these rollers. Um, so um, anyway, let's, um, let's move on here a little bit and then we'll open up for questions again. Appreciate, appreciate the questions you're asking. That's, uh, that's really great. So um, I want to, uh, discuss a little bit that uh, picture I showed in the opening there, which I believe was the toughest conditions I personally ever planted into. And uh, because the, 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 uh, the triticale in this case was so mature, and that's about as difficult as, um, as to be able to cut through that. And I'll just tell you, um, and I'm gonna show you a picture of my row cleaner here in a second, um, but, um, you, I have taken my no-till colder off. Uh, I don't use no-till coulters uh, because I don't feel they're necessary. I feel it, it um, kind of messes up the seed trench a little bit, especially when you're planting a little faster. And especially if you have air or hydraulic down pressure, some of these newer planters uh, really do a good job of getting the seed in the ground. Uh, this is just a picture here of this a little closer up. A little hard to tell. Uh, what you may not have noticed is we were planting 15-inch corn here. It was for silage. A little hard to see the 15-inch rows. But uh, in this case here, I just told you that I usually take my no-till colder off. Um, and, and you can see it here in my next picture coming up. So I want to describe this part because this is kind of important to make this work. Uh, to make this whole planting covers uh, really work. So, um, and, and again, I don't endorse anybody's products, but there are a good amount of nice uh, cover, or, or nice residue uh, cleaners, uh, row cleaners out there. The ones that are, this is the Getter Shark Tooth. Uh, Martin has like a razor, razor tooth or something they call it. They have that swept back design there so they don't wrap. And that's key. The old style original row cleaners don't even try hardly to, to use them in here because they're gonna wrap for you. The other thing is we found 
is the the aluminum treader wheel there that was designed to um that was designed to keep the row cleaner from going too deep in softer conditions but what we found is that that extra width which is a little over about an inch and a half it, it kind of helps to part the cover crop and it does it seems to just do a little better job so this picture was taken here in wet conditions as you can see there's a little you know almost mud there on on that um and this was heavy covers oh and this is i just want to clarify when i took this picture it was not the previous picture where i was planting into the cereal or the triticale okay this was a heavy cover crop mix i was planting into and we did apply down pressure on these row cleaners uh, because I was not getting a good enough cut with my double disc openers. And this is why you have to get off your planter. You have to check. And we're going to have some pictures coming up here soon regarding this uh, and getting a good seed to soil contact. So I put some down pressure. And by the way, if you can see up there, that precision planting uh, uh, air cylinders there, to, you can actually put down pressure and adjust them. I'll just say if, if you don't have adjustable row cleaners, it's it's one thing that you'll really appreciate um, if you can afford it, get them the next planter you get or put them on. It's really nice to make adjustments on the go, especially in situations like this where you can actually literally from the cab, you can watch and you can it's easy to adjust. So uh, but you see there, there's no no till coulter uh, there. That's the way my planter has, has been when I bought my planter in 2013, uh, I did buy no-till colders uh, with it. Uh, but then I promptly took them off, never used them, never used them until this past year when we got into this situation, this picture I just showed you. And here I felt I needed those colders to help cut this. The other thing is they were, they were brand new and they were sharp, which uh, is, is an advantage here. So we used them. Now I didn't even try with or without. We just put them back on. I had them. And um, so going through heavy, heavy covers like this, there could be a, a rationale for using a coulter. And I'm just gonna put that out there because every situation is different. Every field is different. The, the, the soil, the length of no-till, all that factors in here. I'm just trying to lay out to you the tools here that you need to have prepared in order to be able to plant through heavy residue. So um, this is, uh, you know, having row cleaners I think is important uh, and, and being able to have that just in case you're gonna need them um, for, for, for anything in, in these heavy, heavy covers. Um, next, I want to show you a little problem I developed. This was a couple years ago, and um, in this case here, I wanted to put some uh, nitrogen along the row. And if you if you know what you're looking for in there, I have uh, cold or uh, fertilizer colders in there. There was some hairy vetch in this mix, and if you've ever planted before hairy vetch, if you've ever planted through it before, you will know that it'll it'll catch and rip off and it'll start collecting on a planter part. Um, so uh, I'm just saying that that was a problem. You come to the end of the field and you see all these clumps of uh, hairy vetch all over your planter. And when they start dragging six feet long, it's time to get off the planter and pull them off. Well, how do you fix that? Well, I got to thinking and uh, you know, some people would you know give up and cuss out the cover crops at this point. No, we just get a little rope there, and you see how I designed this. I just just went across them row cleaners, and that tilted the hairy vetch. And actually, there was there was triticale and a couple other things in there. It tilted it front as I drove through. That solved the problem. Ten minutes worth of work, almost zero cost. Problem solved. Does it look cool? No. Does it work great? Yes. And I just used them for that one time. That was one situation that I had to use that. Now again, I don't have rollers on my planter. And in this case here, I didn't feel that it merited me rolling the cover crop beforehand. I do have a roller. I was thinking about it, but um, 
just just with the, with the situation that time I did not do it so I just wanted to show sometimes there's little nuances that you're gonna just have to figure it out yourself how to handle heavy cover crops one of the biggest challenges though that farmers face is to uh, be able to get a good seed to soil contact and I just took this picture here where you can see the sidewall of the plant, uh, the seed furrow, I, I, I dug away with a trowel so you could see this. You see the little corn uh, seed right there. And that corn seed happens to be near a piece of residue that was what we call hair pinned or pushed down in and not cleanly cut. Uh, and if it gets dry, air can get down in there and that seed may not germinate. Um, even if the seed slot is closed. If it stays wet, it will probably grow. It probably won't be a problem. But this is what you need to do behind a planter. You need to go back and you need to look and you need to see how are things cutting up front? Is it is it, Are we getting a good seed to soil contact? Because it's a, it's a challenge to be able to have to get through all this. And I didn't have a picture of uh, what could happen with a corn plant, but I did have a comparative picture with squash. I grow a lot of squash. And as you can see on the left side, growing nicely. On the right side, this was merely a couple feet away. It's where the cover crop had blown down and it was crosswise. And you can see there, we didn't get a good cut. And that pumpkin seed did not germinate. It's actually, you can see right down through it. So you have to get that cover crop cut. You have to do whatever you got to do to make it happen, to get it cut. So, um, so uh, and there's, there's different ways of doing that. And we're going to talk about a few more. But the key is to make sure you get the proper seed to soil contact. And, and, and here's what we really are looking for. Now, one of the things that I would say is a little trick that you can do is to simply plant deeper. Uh, one of the things that goes hand in hand with big covers is usually later planting and usually warmer temperatures, both in the air and in the soil. So um, what what uh, and, and there's even without these the, these situations that we that we're talking about here, there's some good evidence that planting deep, in other words, two and a half inches, even three inches deep, with the good vigor we have in our hybrids these days that you can sink them down pretty deep and actually get good yields uh, uh, that way. I know some um, different uh, studies have been done to show that. So, you know, we're, we're, we're at a warmer time of the year. If you can cut, set your planter deeper, it's gonna cut better. And I literally have noticed better stands where I set the planter deeper, two and a half inches. I'm not going three inches yet, but two and a half inches um, and some of you guys may be at that already, I don't know, but when the soil temperature is warmer and, uh, and, and so forth, you can do this and it will give you a better stand in, uh, in heavy cover crops. So I'm gonna pause for a second here and uh, ask if there's any questions up to this point. Uh, I know I've been uh, talking about a lot of detailed stuff here, but um, any questions anybody has about what I just discussed in the last several minutes? Any questions from anybody? Okay, well, then we'll move on. Um, the next thing that we need to, to talk about is uh, our closing wheels, because you know that when uh, the, the popularity of spoke to type closing wheels is, is uh, there's all different kinds that you can get. And some of these closing wheels uh, will lend themselves to wrapping in, uh, in in tall covers, usually when they're over three feet tall or so forth. So here you can just see an example of that. And I mean, I've I've uh, I've had uh, heard of bearings going out. They get so hot in there, they actually seize up and don't turn anymore. Uh, there's nothing worse than uh, being happy about planting into heavy covers and then being very frustrated about your closing wheels, wrapping it up and not turning anymore. You gotta go back to the shop and you gotta get out your uh, your uh, air wrench and uh, you know take all your closing wheels off so that they uh, 
so that you can keep on planting. That is not a good story. And it makes that makes a great day turn into a bad day in a hurry. So there are different types of uh, <clears throat> things you can do for this. Uh, and, and, you know, there are different, of course, a closing wheel that's a little smoother or maybe has a curved tine on it won't wrap near as easy, so it, it does depend. Um, but I do want to show you that there's various companies now have different types of deflectors out there that you can bolt on to your uh, closing wheels and that they can um, be able to uh, keep them from uh, from uh, from wrapping. This is from Yetter. Uh, they have that you could you can just you have to take your closing wheels off, you bolt them on, and it's going to do a pretty good job. One thing I'll tell you though, they got to be really fine tuned just right. If you see the inside of that closing wheel on the right side there, you can see that it's it was it was literally scraping against that. You want your closing wheel to turn to turn freely like you can spin it around with your finger but it needs to be touching or there will be pieces that will start to wrap in that trust me i know uh so it's a matter of getting that bolted on and uh <clears throat> and you might have to uh uh you might have to you, usually the the way they come is they're they're a little bit too tight and then you could take a wrench on the end there like an adjustable wrench and narrow it down and just nudge it back until you get just the right amount. But once they're set, they're set for a while and they're set pretty good. So I just want to mention, if you have invested in these kind of wheels and you don't want to go back to a smoother wheel, uh, this is an option that you get. And again, there are some other ones on the market, but I just wanted to show you uh, these here to give you an, an idea. Um, another thing that I will just wanted to kind of briefly mention and I've shared this a couple other times on other webinars, but uh, Monosim came out. And now many other companies are coming out where you can adjust the pitch of the wheel, the toe in or the toe out. And, and you can adjust the wheels um, in and out uh, side to side so that when they close, they, they more, instead of packing the soil shut, they pull it shut. And um, not running videos today because my internet, my upload speed is just too slow to give a steady streaming video. But uh, different companies are coming out with this now. And it's kind of ironic because I'm this afternoon, I'm supposed to get uh, Yetter's latest design in this. So I'm going to be putting this on as soon as I can. And I'll tell you about it uh, after, I, after I get it on to see how that exactly works. So um, I want to back up here just a little bit. And some of these, some of these challenges we get with these heavy cover crops is, is when they blow down. Um, and uh, those of you who have been on these webinars have probably seen this picture three times or so before because I've used it in many different types of webinars. But this is all about management. This is all about understanding what you're trying to do. And if you are actually attempting to grow big covers and heavy covers, especially rye and triticale and those tough strawy type grains you really don't want them to blow down like this uh, because it makes it difficult to cut through as i've described to you so seeding rate plays into this the fertility of the field manure usage all this stuff feeds into setting yourself up for the ability to plant into heavy covers um, i mean i've 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 heard people have contacted me and they said how do you plan into these heavy covers? They're all flat in the ground. I said, well, you planted them too thick or, you know, you, you, know, you didn't adjust your seeding rate correctly or whatever. And, and granted, I get some blown down in my place too once in a while, but generally not the whole field. And so I just wanted to say you try to avoid this. Now, there are a few things on the market that uh, if you're really committed to heavy cover crops, uh, we talked about the, the the rollers with the double disc openers, which are really effective. Uh, this is also called a cover crop residue slicer made by a local company here in Pennsylvania, Peckway Planter. Um, the direction of the arrow is the direction of travel. It looks opposite what you normally think, but that's actually a single straight bladed disc with narrow gauge wheels set at three inch depth, more or less, two and a half, three inch depth. So they are leading the way, they are holding the cover crop down, and then the blade uh, is able to cut it more effectively. 
So uh, it, it eliminates, pretty much eliminates hair pinning. So um, a lot of this is going on the organic planters, the ones that the ones that want a no-till organic. They want heavy, heavy covers. They don't want to sacrifice anything. And, and you know, if, if it goes down, uh, they want to be able to cut through it. Um, and, and I have these on my pumpkin planter because we wait till June to start planting pumpkins. And yeah, sometimes it does go down. These, these I will say, are very effective. And I, just to prove my point, <clears throat> I intentionally planted across some end rows here. Now, when you see this picture, I did have row cleaners working here, but uh, you can just see how they effectively cut through residue. Uh, and so this is some of the equipment side out there that is that is coming up to meet this uh, to meet this need. And um, so, uh, but then again, I wanted to show you another picture here of how if it's later in the season and you know we have a warmer weather upon us, I don't want to see that row. I don't want to see where I've planted. I I, I want to just tuck the seed down in there. I don't even want to use my row cleaners. But that's provided that I'm able to get the seed in that ground because there's compromises all the time. And if you happen to have a planter that essentially the only way you can get that seed in the ground that you clean the row, well, then you got to clean the row. Um, so I'm just saying by, by what I show here is we are getting that seed in the ground. If you look closely, you can see that that's hairy vetch. A lot of hairy vetch there that's very easy to cut through not a big deal and i can i can tell you in this case that we were getting the seed in the ground so uh, the most important thing is do whatever it takes to get the seed in the ground and uh, then if you're thinking well this is the concept i really love this i want to do this then you can set your planner up for later to maybe get a, um, a less um, uh, you know obtrusive way uh, to get seed in the ground but the thing about what I like here is generally heavier crops are later in the season. Temperatures are warmer. You don't necessarily have to keep that seed slot open to get the crop to germinate. But that's also a factor. Let's just say it is colder than normal and, and you really want that seed to grow. Um, so um, just, again, this is just part of management. Management for the conditions that are there. Um, so I'm gonna pause here a second and to see what kind of questions you might have, uh, anything else that I brought up or, or observations or, or, or things. So uh, what, what questions might you have? Hey, Steve, this is Lloyd. Does that yep. slicer go in place of the colder? You could, you could use it in place of a colder, correct. Um, and then you have to decide then if you want a, um, a, uh, a row cleaner or not. But yes. It certainly does because it's cutting, it's cutting, you know, as deep as your seed slot. It's, it's. I think it's set. The, the, the ability to change it is that they have bolt holes to adjust for the wear of it. Uh, so it's not quite as fine tuned to set the depth, but it's only a single slice. So, you know, even if it's cutting a little bit deeper than your seed is going, I don't, I never really feel that it's a problem. And again, I will say, that even if it is cutting a little deeper. Uh, you're you're talking later on in the season and something planted a quarter inch deep ain't going to matter too much. So, so yes, you could use that instead of your colder. But again, I will say these things aren't cheap either. They're a little. They're like five hundred bucks a row, five hundred and twenty-five dollars a row. I think is what they are. Okay. The uh, the company that makes those. That's Peckway Planter. Okay. Peckway Planter. I can uh, let me write that down. I will put it out to everybody. Then it's here in Southeast Pennsylvania. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll write that down. And I'll I'll list it, the number for them to call them. So. And the name of the name of it is Residue Slicer. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions. Hi, Steve. Um, I got it. Can you hear me? <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Uh, I got a question on. Um, I, I have some cereal rye planted, and um, yep. uh, previously uh, we would kill it six, eight inches tall. We didn't want to get it away. Everybody always told us it was hard to get it killed. So in order yeah. for me to have the excuse to let it grow, I build a, a roller crimper just like the one you have. Uh -huh. 
Um, <clears throat> okay. My question is, is, is the herbicide applicable? We're in contour farming terraces, so uh, roller crimping is going to have to be done post. Um, mm -hmm. Where does the chemical thing come into play? Do I do that after it's rolled? Do I do it before it's rolled, before it's planted? Or, and, and how much time ahead of, or behind should that chemical application be placed? Well, um, there is no exact answer uh, to that. And uh, my answer though, I'll, I'll, start, I'll start explaining this. Um, um, and and, it, and it's, it's, it's a super great question because <laughs> there is no cut and dried answer. So you kind of have to talk it through. If my, my, my rule of thumb for me is if it's wet and uh, there's plenty of moisture, I'm gonna plant first. And I'm going to make sure that seeds in the ground, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to spray later. Now, again, there's different scenarios. If you have a roller on your planter, obviously it's going to be rolled at planting, and many people have had success spraying after they're rolling because it doesn't, you know, you know it's usually not cutting it off. <clears throat> I mean, it's starting to, you know, crimp it up and everything, but it seems that you know you can get a decent kill on it. And actually, when I'm done answering this question, I wouldn't mind come back to John Johnson to see what he does. So John, get ready. Uh, but uh, so so there's there's no exact way to do it. One of the things about spraying early is if you uh, if it's dry, you might want to consider spraying early. And there's no rain in sight. It's like you know a couple of weeks or a week or two before planting. Uh, I, I think we need to mention that here. Uh, and again, you're going to have to have the management uh, expertise to make that decision. I will tell you that when you get 10 to 20 years into this system, the soil is much more forgiving. And even when it gets dry, it's going to be holding more moisture there. And you can um, you have a little bit more options to make. But if you're going to be spraying residual on, it's always best to spray residual um, uh, herbicides on after planting. So you can cover that row that may have been disturbed because if you spray a residual on beforehand, you're just not going to get any herbicide over that row. So that's a consideration right there. Uh, <clears throat> whether or not, let's just say you plant like in your situation, and believe me, I understand contour farming on the hill. That's where that's what I do too. Uh, you could you could spray uh, then or you could roll. I would probably roll and then spray it. Um, that would probably be the preferred method unless there's a good reason not to, just so everything kind of gets down and you, you're you're in a position that when it does rain, that residual will get in there at an even, uh, you know, an even application. So, uh, and John, do you, you have any, go ahead. You go talk ahead, about um, herbicides working more effectively or maybe even pulling back on rates and stuff uh, or mm -hmm. just less herbicide when you roll it. Um, is that because of the injury? Like, you know, you mm -hmm. you spray it after you roll it. I mean, or is it just the combination of the two, say a week apart, is still uh, something that's effective? Well, I think you answered your own question there. I think you're right on, and it, it's partly because the rolling process, uh, a cover crop that's near maturity, like it's it's it's, it's in mid or full bloom, or it's pollinating. You know, it's reached its peak of its life cycle, so to speak, its maximum stage of growth. <clears throat> so it becomes easier to kill than two, uh, just even if you would just be using herbicides without, you know, crimping or rolling. It's easier to kill once it gets to that point. So you're, 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 you're half killing it with your mechanical damage by your planter or the roller. Um, and, and the other thing is, if it's heavy, thick cover, you're getting some natural weed suppression just because you're covering the soil and the weeds can't grow up through. So mm -hmm. the, the argument is, well, you don't need as much herbicide. Now that can be debated. And I will say that a weedy field, a weed has a, his, a field that has a history of weed pressure or high weed pressure. Th this isn't gonna just magically clean up your farm, uh, this concept. Um, so it's, it, it's in the context of, of, of you know, good agriculture and so forth, you can start to reduce your need for residuals. Matter of fact, my goal is to note to, to not use any residuals because uh, then I'll see what I got and there's I have plenty of options to come back with post-emergent type um, materials that are out there. That's my rationale. 
I'm a small farmer, so you know it's it's not like I have thousands of acres to to do, and 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 I don't you know really want to do post emergence type uh, rescue treatments. But that's just me. So I'm just saying what I do, and, and I don't know your scale, but uh, uh, just yeah. several and things. I guess John, go ahead, Lee. No, the reason reason being is because I plan on roller crimping this a little earlier than than your anthesis point, and so I'm wanting to put the yep. the herbicide in as well to make sure I get a good kill. Well, okay, in that case, if you're a little early, I would recommend spraying uh, that first, so you get it in, start getting in the plant two to three days ahead of expected rolling. Now you could spray okay. it, you could spray it. Then you could go plant it because the planter doesn't do a lot of damage to it because you want to give that herbicide a chance to get in. I'm assuming it's glyphosate. Uh, yeah. And you want to get yeah. a chance to get it into the roots and then you go ahead and roll a couple days later. Uh, I've done nope. that many times. Yeah, and I was going to make the so, mistake of going afterwards. So yeah, that was a good, <laughs> good yeah. thing I asked. John, uh, what do you do with herbicides? I like to How do you manage your herbicides? We, we spray after the planting. I like to have as much biomass developed as possible. Yeah. I will say that Penn State University is doing a plot, or uh, we're putting out a plot for them uh, as soon as it dries out in soybeans. Okay. It is. They want us, one part of it, they want us just to plant, and then they want just a burn down spray, no residual. Mm -hmm. And beside that, they want us to plant and have a burn down with a residual. They want to see how much difference there is in weed pressure. You know, has okay. the cover crop helped? How much has it helped? Mm -hmm. They do not, hmm. I would like to have a third option. I would like to roll. This is to be done without rolling. I would like okay. to have a third uh, section where we rolled afterwards to see if that actually gave us better weed control than just having some standing mm -hmm. uh, cover crop burn. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I think the result should be interesting. Uh, Dr. Heidi Reed, mm -hmm. I'm sure you know her, Steve. I yep. think she's told me she's yes. uh, yep. been mm -hmm. working with you too. Uh, yep. She's yep. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, that's good. Uh, Jack, I see you have a question. I'm just going to say that our time, uh, in, a, in a good sense, has gotten away from us here. I'm not going to be able to finish today, which I suspected that could be the problem. So we're just, we're going to, Jack, you can answer your question and then we're, we'll answer it. And then I'm going to wrap it up. We're just going to continue this next week. Um, so, uh, so Jack. Um, what's my my question is around the trying to spray after you have rolled it or crimped it or whatever. Aren't you concerned about having enough uh, chemical uptake and where you've already injured the plant? Well, I'll answer first, and I'd like John to follow up. From <laughs> I'll answer it this way, Jack. Surprisingly, it seems to work. How do, how do you respond to that, John? I have not seen any problem with that. Right. I understand the point being made, but I have not yep. seen any reduction in uh, control. Yep. And I will say, Jack, that's the, the general response. That question has been brought up quite a few times. Um, I still think you need to monitor it, uh, but that has not been a issue that we've had to address. I'll just answer it that way. Um, again, every area is different, but uh, but that has not been has not has not been a problem. Um, so I might also throw in that on this uh, test that John's going to do with the roll versus not rolled on on uh, weed, looking at the different weeds. I did a trial like mm -hmm. that uh, a year or two ago, and those results are in Practical Farmers of Iowa. Mm -hmm. If you want to take a look at those, and bottom line was there was no difference in weed control. Okay. For me. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I want to wrap up here today just to say that um, uh, Mike had a question from uh, from Indiana. He said I had a producer last week ask him. If the barley he had as a cover crop that was headed out, if that was going to be cause problems, he was wondering if it could have been the barley seed germinating, meaning that the seed was to the point that it was mature enough that it could germinate. You know, um, 
if it was me and it was that case, I just go plant it. I've done I've done this enough that yeah, you might have some barley growing in there, but hey, that's no different than inter interseeding. And most of the guys are are most most of the producers are are spraying anyway. Uh, if the, if it's laying on top there, that if it's corn, you know, it just probably isn't gonna just just start growing immediately because because of a herbicide that might be in the soil. But my response is, well, who cares if a little barley survives and grows? It might you just might have a jump start for a, it might be a free cover crop. So I guess Michael, my answer to that is I wouldn't be worried about it unless there's a reason that I'm not thinking about or a special special issue that could arise there um i've done this i've planted into mature barley and um not a problem hasn't been a problem to me so well hey i really appreciate uh, all who joined today and um i think we're just plan to pick this issue up again next week i do have more to talk about on uh, how to look at nutrient credits a little bit more on weed control and a couple other things uh but uh Thanks, thanks a lot for tuning in today, and until uh, next week, stay curious and keep learning. Thank you. Yep.